announcer. I will. Good morning. Hey, there I am. There you are. <laughs> Welcome to First United Methodist Church. Uh, my name is Keith Terman, and I'm the senior pastor, and I'm really excited about today that we get to be together in this place uh, to worship God. And I pray that we can uh, have a moment to uh, just let go of things and to breathe deeply and, and know that uh, not only are we together and not alone, but that God is with us. Um, and that really makes the difference, doesn't it? So I want to welcome you. Thanks for being here, especially if you're visiting. Uh, we have some special guests today, but I um, want to welcome those of you who are, are guests, and especially at home, too, or also at home. Uh, those of you who are, uh, who are worshiping with us and who are visiting with us, thanks for coming. Uh, there, is, um, there are cards in your... Oh, and I have them in my Bible. There are cards in your pew. In addition to the, the red pew pads that the ushers are bringing, uh, if everyone would fill those out, uh, and, and we would have a record of your attendance, and you can, uh, uh, you can write notes and indicate things that, that are important. Uh, if, if you're a guest and would like to share your information, we will contact you quickly. There's also a Connect card that's in the pew, and that's another way that you can, um, that, that you can let us know about yourself and share whatever information you would like with that. Uh, there's also a prayer card if you have specific prayer needs. We take that very seriously. Um, and also a card for... Uh, letting us know that you'd like to get involved some way. We also take that very seriously, and there's lots of opportunities for that. Uh, I discovered this thing in the Awakening Service lobby. I have no idea if it's in our pews. I've been running around this morning, so I haven't looked, but it's, it's a I gave online card. Have y'all got one of those? I thought this is the coolest thing. Somebody's waving one. So one thing I like about it, yeah, so you've got that. So, you know, one of the things about uh, the offering, in just a little while, especially for those of you who are new and um, don't know how we do things, uh, we, we will receive an offering in a little while, and the offering plates will come, and that's an opportunity in our worship service where um, we worship God with that. It's an opportunity for us to, to, while the choir leads us in music, the ushers will come with the offering plates, and we think about all the ways that God has been generous to us, and, and all the ways that God has blessed us, and, and that... As a response to that, we give. And a lot of people will put their check or their cash in the offering plate that comes. A lot of people give online. A lot of people give with their phone. A lot of people will come by the church because that's what they like to do, uh, or they'll mail it. Um, there's just a lot of ways that we can give financially. Um, but also it's about more than just the money that we give and the pledges that we make. It's about the words that we speak and the actions that we do. Like, our response to God is with our whole life. So anyway, that time is coming, and these cards give you something to put in if you've given it, if you've given it home or online or if you're not ready to give anything. Uh, so yeah, so that's what that is. Um, okay, Andrew Hamill, he made the announcement, this an exciting announcement uh, at the last service, and I said, you can come up with me first so he can... Uh, run on out of here because his announcement is about running and uh, Andrew was one of our in our summer interns and so we'll be uh, meeting our interns throughout the summer they literally change the world around here during the summer and we're so pumped uh, that, that Andrew uh, uh, is one of our interns and that he's got this grand vision he wants to tell you about so thank you Keith for that wonderful introduction but uh, yeah I just want to let y'all know that I will be revamping the running club and I can tell we got a lot of runners here so Thursday, 6 p.m., Lake Junaluska Pool. We're gonna be just doing probably one loop, one loop around the lake, but I'd love to see you all there. We, I'd love to see a big number of people and uh, represent FUMC Waynesville. So Thursday, 6 p.m., Lake Junaluska Pool. See you all there. Awesome, thanks, Andrew. Welcome, Andrew. You might be seeing a lot of him. Okay, one last thing. So Jackie Bolden said to me that Bishop Ivan Abrahams was going to be here today. And I thought, oh my goodness, how exciting. He's like, he can't just sit in the pew, can he? And so uh, we invited Bishop Abrahams to, to serve communion with us today. And I thought you all would be delighted to know that. And I also want to just share a little bit about him. Uh, he's, he's really um, uh, an awesome person. And I just met him in my office. But Bishop Abrahams, and so uh, I was given some information. He was elected the General Secretary of the World Methodist Council in 2011 at the World Methodist Conference. The council includes more than 80 member churches, denominations of Methodist, Wesleyan, and uniting, uniting churches from 134 different countries. 
Uh, Bishop Abraham served as the presiding bishop of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, and during his tenure, he provided prophetic leadership and direction. And one of his big accomplishments was getting the Seth Mokitimi Methodist Seminary uh, uh, built. That was a multi-million dollar project. Um, and I, I wanted to read this paragraph. Um, it actually, there's a line in my sermon that uh, connects. Uh, he has called, Bishop Abraham has called on the Methodist Church to listen with big ears to the needs of her people, irrespective of race or color, gender or age. And this sensitivity to the needs of others has been a hallmark of his own pastoral responsibility in his many leadership roles. He has said, I wish to encourage us not to shrink away from the challenges of our day, but to be prepared to transform the world by being humble enough to start with ourselves. In this way, we shall be able to discern the will of God for our time. Um, so thank you for that, uh, Bishop Abrahams. Uh, Bishop Abrahams and his wife Esme have three adult children, four grandchildren, and they live in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, so uh, the very handsome man sitting next to me, that's uh, Bishop Abrahams. So welcome, Bishop Abrahams. <laughs> So one thing I have asked of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of his face and to seek him in his temple. Let us worship. Let us seek together. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us.
Let us pray. Everlasting God, you have revealed yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and ever live and reign in the perfect unity of love. Grant that we may always hold firmly and joyfully to this faith, and living in praise of your divine majesty, may finally be one in you, who are three persons in one God, forever and ever. Amen. You may, you may be seated. We, we have an addition to our service. So Ian, uh, Ian Smith is coming to the microphone, and uh, today is Dollars for Scholars Sunday, so Ian's going to talk about that. Hey, good morning. Um, I'll invite the scholarship recipients uh, up here at this time. I think there's a few of you, yeah. All right, so as Keith said, uh, my name's Ian Smith. I'm the chair of the scholarship team here at FEMC Waynesville. And this Sunday, we are recognizing the recipients from the Dollars for Scholars program. And I uh, just want to thank everybody here that donated money, $2 for scholars in May, uh, whether that was in the offertory or if that was online. Um, together we raised $8,000 and then combining that with uh, endowment funds that we use for other scholarships, we were able to award $40,000 in scholarship money. So I'm going to switch things up from what we normally do. I'm going to read off who was awarded which scholarship first in case you have a connection to one of those funds um, or you know one of those recipients. And keep that in your mind as uh, we introduce them here. Uh, if you would like to reach out to somebody directly, you can get in touch with me. You can talk to the church staff and they can get you in touch with me. And I can get you that info if you want to reach out to that person. Um, so. The Linwood and Mary McElroy Scholarship went to Anna Grace Phillips and Silence Rollins. The Rachel Scholarship to Emily Ferguson. The, Ma the Marion and Walton Garrett Scholarships to Matthew Roberts. The Charlie and Mary Ann Way Scholarship to Parker Montgomery. The Elaine Tucker Wadsworth Memorial Scholarship to Finn Patton. And Alan Stalters, Anna Grace Phillips, Emily Ferguson, Grace Nickel, Jacob Smith, Joseph Klontz, Caitlin Francis, Matthew Roberts, Mackenzie Yazan, Parker Montgomery, and Taylor Soley all received funding from the Dollars for Scholars Fund. So now I'll turn it over to you three here. And so well, just tell us your name, um, if you're already in college or if you just graduated from high school, where you're going, and then something super, super important about yourself, like, I don't know, like, what's your favorite candy bar? <laughs> well, my name is Parker Montgomery, and uh, I'm getting ready to finish up my last semester here at uh, East Tennessee State University in Johnson City, and my favorite candy bar is Reese's. <laughs> Solid. Hi, my name is Finn Patton, and um, I just graduated from Tuscola High School, and I will be at Eastern Tennessee State in the uh, fall this upcoming year. Um, I think my favorite candy bar would have to be a Kit Kat. <laughs> um, my name is Jacob Smith. I just got done with my freshman year at Walford College, um, and I believe my favorite candy bar is also a Kit Kat. <laughs> So this scholarship and this program that we do is so important, so, so important to our church. Uh, really, it lets us live in to our vision. The first one, first part of that is welcoming all. The scholarship program is available to anybody in the community, whether you're a member here or you've never stepped foot on our campus before. 
And the second is engaging the world. So we, our church, is better when we get outside the walls and we get into the community. Higher education is going to have such a huge impact uh, on these recipients' lives. But it's not cheap. And so the money that we raised through the endowments, through your donations, allows us to have an impact on their lives. And in turn, they're going to have a great impact on the world. So I just want to let you all know and any of the other recipients that um, whether this is your first time here or you came up through preschool here or you're somewhere in between, that you're always welcome and you're always welcome to home here. Um, so let's hear it one more time for the 2023 recipients. Would you please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel? Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So we start a new sermon series today, and it's the one you asked for. <laughs> you may remember, uh, if you were here in Lent, we asked you one question. It said, if you could hear one sermon, on any scripture or any topic, what would that be? And so you did. And the responses that floated to the top, meaning the ones that got the most responses, uh, were grouped together. Sometimes they were thematic, similar. Um, helped us to form a five-week sermon series called You Asked For It. Um, today is forgiveness. Uh, next week, Terry will preach, and I will just add as a side note, he chose this one, unanswered prayer, can God change God's mind? And then the next week, evil, which was the top vote getter. Creation evolution will be week four, and then a lectionary sermon, and we'll talk about uh, more about lectionary uh, later. So today is forgiveness. Here we go. You asked for it. One of you said, I'd love for you to preach a sermon on Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22. So that's our text that Terry just read for us. Another of you said, uh, I would love for you to preach a sermon on reconciliation. And then you asked, how can I forgive? My friends, the people that I really respect, who have chosen to deconnect themselves from our denomination that is so connected. So, Peter says, and I think he's, you know, trying to be really generous with this. If a brother or sister sins against me, how many times should I forgive them? Seven times? You know, in his mind, that was way over the top. And Jesus says, no, 77 times. Now, your Bible might have a footnote that says that this could also maybe be translated 70 times 7, which is an even bigger number. Many biblical scholars think that Jesus' response 77 times is an allusion to Genesis chapter 24. In Genesis chapter 24, we briefly meet a man named Lamech. Lamech is the great, great, great grandson of Cain. And Cain 
is the man who killed his brother Abel. So Lamech is boasting to his wives that he has killed a man that had wounded him. And then he says something like, if Cain is avenged sevenfold, he says that he will avenge himself 77-fold on anyone who attacks him. So Jesus is saying that forgiveness is the opposite of revenge. He's not saying that Peter can clobber the guy on the 78th time. He's saying that Lamech got it wrong. That God's way is not the way of vengeance. It's the way of forgiveness. It's the way that leads to life. But if you're anything like me, when you're looking at it, sometimes forgiveness just seems to be impossible. It just can't happen. It's too big. It's, it's too deep. The pain is too much. The chasm is too wide. The harm is too great. I think the problem is, maybe more often than not, is I don't want to forgive you because I resent you. And sometimes my resentment, it can burn so hot that it can become anger, just smoldering deep within. And that's a problem. It's a big problem. And people throughout the ages uh, have acknowledged that. And sometimes folks will say, uh, say it with, with quite graphic language. So for example, Nelson Mandela, he says, resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. <laughs> Frederick Beekner wrote a book on the seven deadly sins. He says, of all the deadly sins, resentment appears to be the most fun. To lick your wounds and savor the pain you will give back is in many ways a feast fit for a king. But then he says, it turns out that what you are eating at the banquet of bitterness is your own heart. The skeleton at the feast is you. You start holding a grudge, but in the end, the grudge holds you. So how can I forgive? Certainly your question, how can I forgive? Anyone who's a part of blowing up our great denomination, but I think it's much bigger than that as I look into y'all's eyes. We have our, our things, those big things, where we find ourselves thinking, feeling, maybe even saying out loud, hey, how can I forgive that? How is reconciliation possible? And it's a big question. So I think it starts with me which is what Bishop Abraham said in his statement. When we begin to take a humble look at ourselves, that's the beginning of it. So um, almost every Saturday morning, uh, sometimes it's while I'm on my way to Lowe's and Bojangles Ham Biscuit, I pull up my app, my phone and my truck are friends, and so when I pull up something on my phone, my truck speakers uh, uh, kick in and it's really nice. Y'all probably have that too. And I hit the, the prayasyougo.org app that I talk about frequently and that maybe some of you have experienced this app so you know what I'm talking about. Every Saturday morning on the prayasyougo.org app is the Saturday Examine. And it's a 10 to 12 minute time for me to examine my life the previous week. That's particularly related to the themes of the app that week, the prayer times that week. St. Ignatius of Loyola, that was his thing. I'm not 100% sure if he started it, but 
but he established a prayer of examine and, and offered different steps. And I think um, for St. Ignatius of Loyola, it was a daily thing, whether it be in the morning, I think maybe evening, uh, you examine your life. And so the first step that, you, that you, you take is you, in prayer, you give thanks to God. There's a lot in the scriptures about that. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Like, we enter into a prayer, our prayer time, with a thankful heart, even if we don't feel like it. It's the discipline of thanksgiving. And we begin to thank God for the ways God has blessed us. And I don't care how messed up my life is that day, how stressed I am, how angry I am, how much of a mess it is, there's always something that I can be thankful for. It's, it's small, it's big, but at the end of it, what I know is that I am blessed. God has blessed me. And that's an important place to land. The second thing, after asking the, the Holy Spirit to show up and, and give strength, is you begin this, this hard work of soul searching, which is why you need the Spirit. So on purpose, you examine your soul, particularly noticing those places where we've messed up, where we have failed, where we have hurt someone or ourselves, or where we have caused harm, or maybe where we have been disobedient, where uh, surely God has expected us to do that today or this week, and I just didn't get around to it. And at the end of that prayer, I become fully aware that I am a sinner. And that too is an important place for me to land. To be aware of it, but also to claim it and to own it. And then a next step is a prayer of confession. We'll do that collectively as a group in just a little while as we approach this table. But I confess and I cry out to God for help. And at the end of it, I know that I am forgiven and I can begin to heal, uh, feel the healing that's happening. And that's an important place for me to be, is to know that. And so, you end it with looking at tomorrow. Now that I am in this place, blessed, forgiven, healed, I think about the life that I'm going to live tomorrow. What am I going to encounter tomorrow that now is going to be different because I've prayed this prayer of examining myself today? Psalm 103. I want to read some verses from Psalm 103. It'll be familiar to you, some of the, these verses. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Bless the Lord who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, he will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And this is the verse you'll know. As far as the east is from the west. So far, he removes our transgressions from us. Sometimes, from my vantage point, I say there's no way God can forgive me. There's no way God can forgive me for that. And yet God does. Because that's who God is. And I would argue, that's who God calls us to be. So, 
now that I've dealt with myself, I can have a conversation with you. And Jesus says some pretty tough things in this category for us in his Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, love your enemy. And love is not a, I mean, love is a feeling, but I think you can't command a feeling, so love is an action. It's a verb. Love your enemy, whoever that may be. He says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And persecute is a pretty serious, horrible word if you are on the receiving end of it. Pray for the people who persecute you. Now, that's really hard to do, but it works. It amazes me and has amazed me my whole life that it works. When I have prayed for this person that I perceive to be my enemy, then my dreams of revenge, they just disappear. I no longer wish harm. So, one thing that we also know is the conversation requires a lot of listening. And that's, you know, we, our, our two verses that are our text today are part of a, a larger passage, really, uh, in Matthew chapter 18, beginning with with verse 15, it starts with when someone sins against you, what do you do? And Jesus says there's a process to this. And, and it's f familiar to us maybe. Um, and it's, it's a process of listening. And it starts with the individual. And it's, it's intimate in that way. But if, if the listening falls apart and we're not hearing each other, then it becomes a group thing. There's, there's a few others in the circle. The circle becomes a little larger and it becomes group listening. And then of course, the next one is congregational listening, which we have some experience with. So, I've got to do something. When I think about our question, how is it that I can forgive this person who has harmed me? It starts with me. It includes lots of listening. But it's not just cerebral, it's active. I have to do something. So this ministry of reconciliation that Paul talks about um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And that's what happens at the end of my prayer, when I start with me. Now, now granted, this probably also includes those who are coming to faith for the first time. But even for we old salty dogs who've been around for a long time and find ourselves in a really bad place, God meets us and everything becomes new. And I, I'm sure you, at least to some degree, know that experience. I am a new creation. And it's in this place that I start. And so, uh, then Paul says, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So I know I've told this story before. I know exactly when I told it. It was five years ago, Easter Sunday morning. <laughs> it's also a well-traveled story, so I'm sure you've probably heard it and know it from other places, but I am personally moved every time I hear it or read it, and I think it's extremely appropriate. It's, it's in Moscow in 1941. We know what's happening in Russia in 1941 a lot of atrocities. 20,000 German soldier prisoners are about to march through the streets of Moscow. The defeated army in front of this population that will be gathered on the pavements who has experienced the brunt of their cruelty. And uh, those who are gathered are, are mostly going to be uh, the women and children who have experienced great suffering at the hands of these soldiers. Most of them will have lost someone, a, a husband, a, a brother, a son, uh, even uh, 
mothers and, and sisters. So you can imagine the atmosphere in that place, the anger. Uh, maybe we, it's hard for us to imagine the, the feelings that they're feeling when at last they are going to get to see their hated enemy uh, marched in, in front of them. And so at the beginning, of course, were the, the military leaders, the generals and such. And even though they were prisoners, they still had the arrogance about them and they were strutting through the streets. The crowds, of course, were venomous. The things that they shouted, spitting in the snow. And then came the soldiers. They were just boys, really. They had frostbitten feet. Their feet were wrapped in newspapers. Some of them were leading their comrades because their comrades were blind. They were makeshift crutches. And all of a sudden, the crowd grew completely silent. And all you could hear was the shuffling of feet and the clonking of homemade crutches of this army of broken young boys. And then there was movement. Something was stirring in the crowd, and it was an old babushka woman. And she made her way up to where the Russian soldiers were guarding the curb, and she pushed her way through. I've got to get through. And she goes straight away to this one gaunt soldier who's so exhausted, he's just tottering on his feet. And everybody else is just kind of holding their breath. What's she going to do? Is she going to slap him? Is she going to spit in his face? She reaches into her shawl and she pulls out a piece of black crusted bread. And she awkwardly puts it in his pocket. And then before you know it, from every direction, from both sides of the street, these women are, are pushing through and coming up to these soldiers, perhaps giving a cigarette or a, a piece of bread or a, a piece of dried fish. And somehow, the hatred was gone. Enemies were no longer enemies. And we wonder why. <laughs> Well, it was because one person, an ordinary, an ordinary person, just broke through this cycle of anger and hate and revenge with one act of what might be called uh, pardoning or, or redeeming love. How did she do that? Think about that. I mean, didn't they kill her husband? Didn't they blow up her home? We've seen images in Ukraine, not too terribly far from where this story happened. Just the, the, the rubble and the death and the grief. How can we forgive those who are blowing up our stuff, whether it's our denomination or our marriage or our family or whatever that might be? this thing that we're carrying with us. How is reconciliation possible? How can we forgive? And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think we can. But we look at this table and we remember we remember that on that night, Jesus took this cup and this bread. We remember the very next day, his words from the cross. You, you know them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that changes everything. Amen. Would you please?
please rise as you are able for our affirmation of faith and the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. As we come into time to talk about some things in our church life, I think all of you know this, but I will say it or repeat it in case you didn't see your email or whatever, but the Haywood Choral Society concert that was scheduled for this afternoon had to be postponed. So we regret that, but we look forward to it uh, in the fall, probably in September. Look forward to, to that. So that has been postponed. Um, not sure what happened to some more altar railing, but I know it's harder than it looks to get those all back up, so we'll deal with that this Sunday and have them back together more fully uh, in later Sundays. Bible time start tonight uh, through the 7th of June. Uh, the sign-up details are in your bulletin. If you'd like to volunteer, uh, there's a contact also in the bulletin, the information you might need and a QR code, or just show up and uh, if you want to help and I'm sure somebody will find something for you to do. So that's uh, starting tonight. Also, the June, Juneteenth Freedom Celebration is going to be at uh, here uh, in our grounds parking lot. It's a community event, but we are letting them use this place uh, outside for the celebration from 4 to 7 p.m. We'll need volunteers before, during, and after the event. And there's information in the bulletin, and also you can call the office. So, look forward to that. And Keith has an announcement he would like to make. I'll try to be quick. I'm excited, so that usually slows me down, or makes it longer. <laughs> so, a lot of you, this is just to a, just a update you on our future as far as clergy staff goes. You know, uh, Becky Brown, our longtime and beloved associate for 14 years, uh, last Sunday was her last Sunday, and so a lot of you are curious about uh, what's up and how are we going to move forward. And so, um, just a quick word about the process and, and what we've decided to do. Um, the timing of this was such that uh, appointments in our annual conference are made and, uh, and announced, I think, I, I forget which Sunday it was, because I forgot to announce to you all that I'm going to be your pastor again for another year. So that's a, my apologies for that, um, So, which I'm very excited about. I hope you are too. But that announcement, those announcements happen in April. And so there's a process for associate pastors um, that, that I'm not sure if it's changed, but historically it's been in, in the fall, uh, late fall. 
uh, congregations and pastors, let it be known to the bishop and the cabinet. And you can stand up and correct me, Bishop Cameron, if I've got this wrong, but let the bishop and cabinet know uh, of, a, of a desire um, that, you know, we would say we need a new, a new pastor and the process begins. And so, um, so we're going to wait and, and go through the process this fall for our new associate pastor. And that gives us the opportunity to interview folks and to, you know, to, be, to partner with the bishop and cabinet. Uh, they will ultimately make the appointment, but we get, to, we get to say, hey, we think this would be awesome, and they'll consider that. You know? So in the meantime, as we thought about how are we going to, um, in this interim time of transition, make it? Well, a lot of you know that our congregation is full. Uh, not, not too full, but very full of a lot of retired clergy um, and, and ordained persons. And, and so uh, we're quite confident that we're going to be able to, um, to move forward in Becky's absence. I mean, she leaves a big hole and uh, is going to be missed. Uh, but we feel confident that, that we have a, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of you will be able to help. Another thing, too, is just right on the heels of our, our John Wesley series, where we really thought a lot about that early Methodist movement, those early Methodists depended on the laity for almost every ministry that matters. And, and so we're, we are such a blessed and gifted congregation. So uh, we're not stressed about that. Uh, but we are going to bring an interim pastor on. And I'm feeling really excited about this. Um, one of our former pastors, Reverend Rob Blackburn, is retiring at Central in Asheville. And so in August, he's going to come. And uh, so when I first started in ministry, uh, I was at Faith and Francis Cove in town, and the next year, Rob Blackburn became the pastor of this church. And he kind of, I was 24 years old, 25 years old. He took me under his wing. Um, he helped me as I was writing my papers for the ordained ministry process. Uh, I've been on wilderness trail with Rob. We've done confirmation retreats together. Um, and so not only is he a, a mentor of mine, but he's a good friend. Another thing that I, that I feel excited about is Many of you know him. He has been your pastor. Um, you have been his congregation. And I don't know what the percentage is, but uh, I'll, he'll step right in and you will be able to, uh, to have a relationship with him as pastor. So that's, that is pretty awesome. He, he is one of the, the great preachers, I think, of our conference. Uh, so it, it's, a real, it's a real gift to me personally and I think to, for us as a congregation. And another, another part of it is uh, his sons are on staff. And so there's this gift of... Uh, father and sons working together. When we were called to be missionaries in Indonesia, that was one of the things that I was most excited about was I get to be in ministry with my mom and dad as missionaries. And that fell apart, and that's a long story that I won't tell. Um, but so I know, I know the, the joy that Rob will feel to be able to, to be a part of ministry here for, for this season. So anyway, I just wanted to make that announcement to you and um, let you know that's what our future looks like. So. As we go into our time of prayer, we have a few announcements. They're not all by any means, but some that are concerning us this week. Doris Smith, Jeff Smith's mother, broke her ankle. She is in the assisted living facility. John Atkins was a custodian here some years ago, and he is undergoing a multiple series of medical tests to locate and determine the cancer. He has cancer of some kind, and they're trying to determine where and exactly what to do uh, for that. Archer Metzger is a third grader in our congregation who had eye surgery last week, and he is recovering placidly at home, uh, mostly face down. So if you're a third grader trying to lay down most of the day face down, you or a parent of a third grader uh, trying to keep a, a child down for that long, but we are praying for Archer and, and his recovery from his surgery. And then Jim Connolly is having shoulder surgery this coming Friday. So we pray for these. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. If you, O oh Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. Gracious and loving Lord, we gather here week by week, mindful of what we have done that we should not have done, and what we have not done that you have commanded us to do. We recognize that we are fallen 
sinful people, and that no matter how good our intentions or how earnest our efforts, we will often fall short of our own noble intentions and will always fall short of your divine perfection. But you are patient with us, understanding of the world we live in, and patient with our efforts, however grand or meager, to live as you would have us live. Continue with us and strengthen us as we struggle to put aside those things that lead to emotional and spiritual death. Show us where we are immune to or oblivious of the gifts that you have so graciously provided. Keep us from the snares of disputes and disruptions and from the designs and dictates of the world and the noise around us. Calm us so that we can hear your word to us. Break us free from the slights or injuries of those who have offended or demeaned us. Open our hearts to see into theirs, to understand or at least realize the burdens they bear and the forces around them that have affected their actions or their words toward us, so that we can forgive them as you continually forgive us. For with you, there is steadfast love, and with you is great power to redeem. Forgive us, redeem us, we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift that this day is, the opportunity to be in this place, to sing to you and to pray to you and to do that together. Uh, We're very grateful. We're grateful for the ways you bless us in the big ways and the small ways. And Lord, we we bless you with this offering and with uh, our lives today. And we ask that you would hold us close uh, and with your blessing that we can faithfully live as your church together in this place, in this time. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. And now if you will, uh, if you will join uh, with me with your yellow insert, and we will also be turning to uh, page number 13 in our United Methodist hymnal as we share together in our liturgy. Christ invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not been faithful stewards of your creation. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take it. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you, This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of those of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ Christ has died. Christ Christ is risen. risen. Christ Christ will come again. Pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may
may be for, for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honour and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we partake of the one loaf. The breaking of the bread is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. And so as folks are preparing, uh, can I get the... There it is. <laughs> That's part of what I want to say. Thanks, Terry. As, as our uh, table is being prepared and as our servers are being prepared, just a few things I want to share with you. Um, we will all be wearing masks and we'll, we'll uh, as you see, hand sanitizing and we're trying to be as safe as possible. Um, and so uh, we will have uh, stations for you to come. The ushers will give some guidance. Uh, the first thing I want to, I want to say is that uh, this is not our table, it's the Lord's table. So you are all invited to come. You are all welcome. You do not have to be a member of this church. You do not have to be a member of any church. Just a desire in your heart to meet God in this place, uh, to confess your sin and know God's forgiveness, uh, to open your heart to, to all that God has. And God will inspire you and call you um, and, and send you on some fantastic adventure, I'm sure. So you need to know what you're getting into when you come. That being said, it's fine for you to not come. If you're not ready to, to partake of communion and it's still a new thing, just please feel comfortable just staying in your pew. Um, the wafers are gluten-free, so that uh, won't be an issue for any of you. That, that's normally an issue. Um, as Terry said, we've lost a few of our kneeling rails, uh, but there are some here. So if you would like to kneel um, as, uh, after you've received communion, you will receive the wafer and a cup and um, there will be baskets that you can put the, the empty cup in. Uh, the ushers will give guidance if you have, have any questions with that. Also, if you are unable to come forward but would like to receive communion, uh, just let an usher know and we will, we will make sure that the communion comes to you. Uh, those of you who are at home, hopefully you've been able to gather some bread or juice um, and a, a sacred space uh, so that uh, you can uh, worship with us in this way uh, at home. Uh, the John Christie Fund is, is a fund uh, many... many uh, if you like to, to give an offering, you can put that offering on the rail. You can also designate that. Um, the John Christie Fund was started when John Christie, a former pastor of this church, um, uh, created it to reach out to our community. Monday through Saturday, folks come with, with lots, as you can imagine, specific needs. And this uh, enables uh, our office during the week to, to help out in a lot of different ways. So anyway, I think I covered it all. Uh, I do hope you'll come to this table, and I trust that God will meet us here. Let us worship in this way.
Let us pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks for coming today. Um, maybe you'll have a moment to, to greet uh, Bishop Abrahams after the service. Um, a New Testament scholar, N.T. Wright, says that forgiveness is like the air in our lungs. We can only take the next lung full when the previous one has been exhaled. As we go today, I pray that we can breathe that kind of air. I believe our future depends on it. God bless you and go in peace. Amen. <laughs>